And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of Other er Other Earths, going in going for a science fantasy affair, and the head honcho of Infinite Odyssey Games. At the very least it's a short at the very least is a better Odyssey than what Homer had to put up with. The one and only Tom Balding. He is not a major. How you doing today, man? I'm doing really good, man. Thanks for having me. I had to get that Major Tom joke out of my system. I'm pretty sure you've heard that before. <laughs> a couple times. But at least you didn't go for the balding joke. <laughs> no, that would be too easy. I'd rather I'd rather go with I'd rather go with the fact that I could see I could see some pe I could see some people um singing ground control to Major Tom to Major Tom just to annoy you. <laughs> Yeah, most people just go for the low hanging fruit. <laughs> some people, so I appreciate people, it. <laughs> some people have no sense of artistry. Nah, nah, it's just you know, quick, quick grab. <laughs> I, I like, I liken that to the comedic version of junk food. Yes. Yeah, you walk in, get your fast fix, and then you just leave me hanging. No, no, no! Don't even give me something clever to tell later. <laughs> yeah. And the but uh, I'd but given give, but given that, um, it's a bit of a tradition around here to open with the humble beginnings. So, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. So I I got into role playing games about about to be six years ago now. Mm -hmm. uh, I met a, I met my actually my game the game designer on our company uh, Josh Hartley. We were coworkers uh, on Long Island, and he had been he came and we were talking, and he came to me and he said, "Hey, I'm designing this game, and you know, I, you know, you want to play? You want to play test it with us?" And I said, "Sure." So my introduction to role playing games wasn't actually through something like D and D anything like that. It was through what would become the first iterations of this game that we're making now, and kind of just got me hooked i really enjoyed it and he had a huge passion for it and the industry as a whole and he started to help me dip into it a bit mm -hmm. and i've been continuing to do that ever since you know i've I'm, i've i've found the the treasure trove of kickstarter so i'm getting a lot of stuff sent to me in the mail <laughs> but uh it's just you know that was that was i was never a person who was like oh like i didn't have any friends who played it when i was young you know Oh, and so like when my my buddies were all just playing video games, we didn't really know tabletop games. So, as a young adult, I started to meet more people that were in it, groups in college, different things like that. And so I slowly started to build myself in this hobby, and I really enjoy it. It's a it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, and you have no idea how refreshing it is to ha to have to have somebody whose introduction wasn't D and D for a change, and I. I know it's easy to I know it's easy to slag on D and D because well because well lightning always strikes the highest point, but it's but whenever it whenever it's whenever the origin story isn't that you end up getting some interesting results. Um. Now, when it comes to uh, when it comes now, Other Earths is described as a as a science fantasy RPG. Um. Now, the, a genre like science fantasy can take a lot can take a lot of different um, turns. Sometimes, sometimes you can go with sometimes you can go with something more space opera y a la um, do, um, Dune. Sometimes you can go with the with the hybrid genre setup that you have with um, Shadowrun, and some sometimes you can go you can go a bit Star Wars y. Um, and the, just to na just to name a few big entries in that in that front, there's plenty and there's plenty of wiggle room in between all that. What sort of vibe is Other Earths go going when it comes to the concept of science fantasy? So I think that 
Now, it was, it's funny that you bring up sort of something like uh, space opera, like Dune. You know, we used to categorize it somewhat like space opera uh, in its early iterations. It's since strayed away from that, but I think we've still managed to maintain a lot of that sort of Dune, like Dune inspired feel in our game. At least, you know, I take that away from it when I when I play it. Uh, but, you know, we did take a lot of inspiration from the uh, Star Wars D6 game. Mm-hmm. And a lot of inspiration from media such as uh, Stargate SG One, different things like that. So I think we fall a little bit more away from away from the Star Wars side, more towards the Dune side. But both elements are there. Mm-hmm. But so I think the thing that really uh, the thing that really like makes it sort of like Dune esque for me is how we tried to do like the intermingling of like politics and race and different things like that. I think a little bit more than something like star Wars does in that sci-fi setting. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned, you mentioned the, you mentioned using, utilizing the D six system. Um, and sent, and since the, and, um, obviously, Obviously, that's one, obviously that's one game that's been mentioned in the last few minutes that utilizes six-sided die in in pools. But usually, when it comes to any sort of system that relies on rolling multiple die, you can put them into two categories. I like I like I like to call this sum based and hit based. Um, something like Star Wars D six is sum based. It's more about ro- it's more about rolling a total m- a a number of die and a- adding them all together to compare to compare to a target number. Whereas something like Shadowrun is hit based. It's more about rolling and seeing how many successes you get, how many die are over a certain threshold. Where does other Earths fit into that? Uh, we're very much on the Shadowrun side of things. We are we are success or hit based. So. If you're trying to make a check in other Earths and you're allowed five dice, five D6 dice, mm-hmm. anything that's a five or a six is considered a success, and that's going to determine whether or not you fail. We're not terribly concerned about the sum, unless it's in very uh, particular circumstances, and sometimes at the discretion of the GM. But the system itself relies on hits. Mm-hmm. And I think that we, we debated making it a sum based game but i think in the end that we found what we what one of the things that we wanted to do is make sure that gameplay goes quickly and it's much easier when especially when you have a larger amount of dice or a lot of players at the table to just say oh these hit these don't that's a simple you know little calculation versus like 5 10 12 you know <laughs> yeah now in the in that same vein since you mentioned it being a success based affair that brings that brings up a couple questions that I have. One is pool generation based on the, based on a attribute and skill um, formula. So the pool is based on what we have your basic stats, right? So brawn, agility, stamina, things like that. That gives you your base amount of dice, and then from there, everything is abilities based. So. You can purchase abilities with experience points, and if they are relevant to whatever check you're making, mm-hmm. and you can add dice to those things. Items so will sometimes also give you bonuses to rolls. Uh, for instance, like something like you know firing a weapon. If you have a scope on it, you know at a certain range, you won't lose a dice, or you'll gain a dice. So, so it's basically built out through off of the basic stats from your abilities and items, which certainly which certainly makes sense and the and um the other th- the other thing that i was curious about is <clears throat> a lot of games that use that pool setup and a lot of games period will get a, will get a little bit creative when it comes to e- when it comes to extra effect um you can't when it when you're doing pools you can't really do the whole critical and botch the way the way you could with a with a more straight die result Mm-hmm. Um. So, for in, for instance, with Sh- with Shadowrun, if you if you manage to roll and you end up rolling a certain amount of um ones, that's referred to as a glitch. 
where you succeed, but something else happens. Some, right. um, I always call it the but and rule. Um, <laughs> I like that. Ecl Eclipse phase has a similar thing where that where um where its cr where its criticals and botches are determined by whether or not you roll doubles since it uses a d100 system. Um, with with other Earths, do you have do you have something similar where there's a cer where there's a certain result type that might result in extra effects? So if you fives and sixes are successes uh, in our game, and if you roll three sixes in, or if you have less than three, then you know if you just roll like all your dice as sixes, mm -hmm. but it's counted as a critical success and it adds two successes onto the roll. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a little bit more generous than 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 uh, unforgiving with our criticals, so it's harder to get a critical fail. I believe uh, at, at this point you still need all ones to be a critical fail. Mm -hmm. But what we have attempted to do is build systems around the dice that affect gameplay. So, like, if you don't get a certain success level on a roll, it's not just oh you failed to do it, you know, like whoopsie doozles. Mm -hmm. It's there's other systems in place that are just like, like if you're trying to talk to somebody, we have a system called alarm, where if I speak to you attempting to lower your alarm and I fail, there's a direct consequence to that. So what we've done is try like build all these auxiliary systems around the dice that sort of give those extra effects without having to build it into the number of successes, like in that specific way. Would you say that you're fo more focused on degrees of success re than a, than a pass fail system. That's a good question. Uh, I believe in certain instances, yes. I believe in others, no. So, like I said, we we've dealt a lot with our uh, diplomacy system, mm -hmm. and definitely, though there is a pass fail threshold, there definitely is with the alarm system like a degree of success. Like if I do really good on a roll, I can plummet your alarm level down to nothing. You'll be my friend. But if I do marginally okay, you'll still accept what I'm saying, but you'll still be suspicious of me, and I'll still have to work to get you to trust me. Mm -hmm. So there is a certain level in there where it's like degree of success. But as a general rule, like in combat, pass fail is uh, rules the day, unless you're talking about something like you didn't throw a grenade well, how close is it going to land to you, how much are you going to be messed up by this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we tried to like mimic reality in a certain way where it's like some things are just you succeed or you fail and that has a direct outcome and other things are i can botch this interview but i might not botch it so bad <laughs> <laughs> right but so things like that so we try to like take it on a case-by-case -case basis as best we can obviously within the system that we have mm -hmm. now a lot of a lot of games have some sort have some sort of extra effort pool some sort of limited resource that you can utilize to give yourself a bit of a boost in limited circumstances. Um, hmm. To use the Shadowrun example again, they they have ed they have edge. Um, one could one could argue that there, that force points could co could qualify in certain D six games, but not every D six game you utilize that. Of course, um, I think th I think there was one I think there was one other with D six, but it's been a while since I've touched. Uh, my West End library, so I'd have to double check. <clears throat> um, World of Darkness has willpower. Um, Eclipse phase that I've mentioned before has Moxie. Um, and Legend of the Five Rings has void points. Do you have something similar within this system? And if you do, how would that work? So, in terms of just. Uh... Like, an, like you know, a, a skill pool that allows for particular dice. I don't. We don't really lean into that too heavily. We're more focused on abilities and things that let you re-roll failed dice. Mm -hmm. So instead of like granting extra dice outside of the abilities and items that I mentioned before, uh, the only thing that I can think of that might qualify as one of the systems is we have built in something where if it's a non-time specific uh, action, like if I'm trying to hotwire a car. If I roll and I need three successes and I only get one, I can then on my if I my next action also is to try and hotwire that car, I can keep that one success as a bonus and only need to get two. Mm -hmm. 
but we do use a rollover system in that regard. That's about as close as I think we get. But we really focused more on, like, okay, this is the limited pool of dice you get. You have to do the most with that dice pool, and all the bonuses we build around it are about second chances or staving off failure for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. There are certain uh, racial bonuses that you get. So if I have, if I'm an elf versus an orc from two different timelines. I get, uh, if I'm the orc, I get a plus one bonus to my intelligence uh, right off the bat, and the elf doesn't. He gets a plus one bonus to his willpower. So those, depending on the race you choose and the timeline you're from, you will get certain bonuses just built into your character, but it's still not really like exactly like those systems you were referring to. Mm -hmm. now, with, now, with that in mind... You've you've talked you've talked about it being a a um, classless and levelist system. Now that has it that has its benefits, but it do but there are certain questions that that kind of decision can raise. One of them, and this is something that I pick on Shadow I've picked on Shadowrun for years, is having a having a skill system that gets so that gets so large it results in analysis paralysis um okay. so when when you're doing something freeform how what steps have you guys making taken to make sure that people don't get overwhelmed by choice so i think the i think it goes back again to like we're trying to give you the sense of like limited pools so if i have my basic stats brawn agility sense whatever have you I'm only given at the beginning of the game a certain amount of points to spend on that, and it's not as many as a character might like. So if I'm trying to be a spellcaster of a certain type, I'm going to definitely want to go for high intellect. And that's going to have to come at the cost of some other things. So though we have a very wide variety of things to choose from, depending on what you want to be, and you can certainly you know be a multi-class quote-unquote character, but uh, if you're trying to spec into something still a wide variety but it's not so deep that you fall into like analysis paralysis there's kind of we've kind of tried to build it not in a linear progression but kind of in a in a in a branching way where if i say at the beginning like i want to be a witch you know mm -hmm. that also that also is a heavy tank so it's like okay i know how i gotta stack my basics to make that happen and i also have an idea of what type of things i'm gonna need to do on the battlefield so i can ignore these other things and i can focus on getting these things mm -hmm. so now there still is a very wide range of things to choose from. We've we, you know we've tried very hard to give every type of player the majority of options possible. You know the talkers and their abilities get just as much as the the damage doers and the spellcasters. So you know, it, at the end of the day, it's just about deciding what you want to be and then seeing what works within that range because everything is sort of laid out in categories. You can go to this category and say, oh, I want to affect alarm level as a talker. These are the 10 abilities that I'm going to need to focus on, you know? Yeah. Now, with, the, with that in mind, when it comes to... Um... When it comes to character, when it comes to character creation, there are some there are some people who who do the whole who do the whole thing of, here's the number of points you got, spend, spend what you like, go at, go at it. Which... I think is a I think is a little bit of what I call swim, damn it. Um, and then there there are some that have them. There's some that have a bit more structured approach to it. Um, where do you guys fall into that? And are, have you guys considered putting in some um, suggested packages in ca in character creation? We do have. We are a little bit swim, damn it. Uh... It, it, by the definition you just given, we do have uh, role play suggestions, character creation suggestions. One of the things that we are going to be releasing is the quick start guide, which is going to have pre-made characters and suggest suggested paths for how to upgrade those characters. Mm -hmm. uh, but just if someone just comes to the table and says, "I don't care about all that. I just want to make a character," it is a little bit. You're presented with like, "Okay, here's all the races you can be." Here's all the timelines they can be from, and here's every bonus that those races and timelines get. Here's your basics and how many points you get for them. So you can spend within these parameters. Can't have less than one. Can't have more than six. And 
and here's all your abilities and items and how much you get to spend on them. Go forth. <laughs> so it is a little bit deep into the pool, unless you want to, you know, make use of the materials we have to not have to do that. So we we let both types of players have their moment. Mm -hmm. I can I can certainly get that. And could hold on one moment. Well, since you mentioned races and timelines, that's as good a spot as any to talk about that. Is all right. We've, I think you, I think you and I have ha have had experiences with certain popular fantasy games, where at a certain high, at a certain point, your choice of race doesn't matter as much. Be um nah. beyond role playing, beyond role playing. So, how much of a factor does your choice of race and your choice of timeline play into character creation? So, it it, it plays a little bit, like I said, uh, every timeline ha and every race have their own bonuses. So, if I decide to be a uh, human from Earth as we know it, then those two things determine if I start the game with a plus one to my charm, if I start with a plus one to my agility, things like that. If I decide to be an orc from a different timeline, then they're not as charming, but they have very high intellect, and they're also good at blood magic. So they're going to get you know a plus one to intellect and a plus one to sense, things like that. So the we tried to make it to where it's not monumentally important. It's not going to like you know make or break you being able to do whatever you want as a character. But we definitely give uh, direction for what type of character that you know you might want to play. So a person who picks an orc might be having like being you know a smart or a magic casting person in mind, and a person who picks an elf might want to be you know a, a sniper or something like that. A person who picks a human might want to be a talker, things like of that nature. But even within the races, the timeline can affect that because there's these races are coming out of multiple cultures and timelines and backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So on that, obviously, like you said, like it, it'll make a role play difference if you choose to have it make a role play difference. There's a lot of uh, racial and, and and cultural tension in the game that that can be played in if it wants to be. But in terms of actual consequence, basically it's just those bonuses right there. There are also some abilities that uh, only be get can only be gained if you are a particular race. Like for instance, if I wear a certain clothing uh, that might ingratiate a certain faction to me, it won't work if I'm a human and it's an elven faction. Mm -hmm. So certain things are going to be determined by what people see you, what you look like, you know? Oh, yeah. But you're not one of us. You're one of us, you know? Now, take, now um, taking, that, taking that into account, um, I think with science fantasy and fantasy, it can be very, it can be very tempting to hyper-focus on, um, ca on casters. Hmm. Now... The bi the big example is is the is a common whipping boy for for me when it comes to this sort of thing, but there but there are other instances and I'd I'd say one of the rare cases where this doesn't really apply would be would be something like Ars Magica where, um mad where magic heavy use is kind of the point. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to the when it, com when it comes to the martial end of things. If somebody if somebody wanted to make a um, other Earth's version of say the weapon specialist, would they still be would they still be able to do that? Would they still be able to do that and have a good amount of an action economy for themselves? Oh, definitely. So one of the things, uh, like I touched upon earlier, that we focused on was giving martial characters, the dipl diplomatic characters, and the magic heavy characters all very similar pool of abilities and items to choose from that if we've done our job correctly should even out over the course of the game so magic is powerful and magic is scary and there's three different types of magic that all have their own uses but what we've attempted to do is make it to where 
one type of magic that you might specialize in is not going to necessarily get you through every situation as best as it could. Whereas maybe a long, because it's not super long range or, and it's not super fast, you know? Mm -hmm. So what we've tried to do is we've tried to even it out to where like, okay, can the guy with the rapier and the, and the pistol fight the guy who can shoot lightning out of his hands? You know? And if we can say yes to that question, then we can keep those things, and that's that's good. We can move forward. If they can't do that, then we might have to look at balancing issues. So, well, certainly, one of the, and I hate to say the word archetype or metas in this situation, because they we've tried to stray away from those, but you could build a character who's just a weapon specialist and get through the game perfectly effectively without having to touch magic or talking to people. Yeah. But... Go ahead. I know. I know some. I know some people like like to claim that game like that um game balance isn't necessary. I I would argue. I would argue that well, for one, in one of those cases, the person who made that argument was known for some rather infamous additions to the game that he was working on at, at the time that were blatantly overpowered, and he got raked over the coals for that. Um, and. Two, I think I think the ne the question of the necessity of game balance is something of a red herring. If okay. if only if only because of the if only because of the fact that peop that the question the question is I don't think the question is more of balance but more of um via uh, more of viability as much as as much as every designer. I don't think any. I don't think anyone outright designs for a certain meta. It's just so, it's just something that happens with and with enough time. Oh. But when it comes to when it come, but the re, but when it comes to game balance, I think a lot of people conflate that with the characters being the same. No, it's more. It's more of. It's more about characters not being too useful in some regards. Oh. oh, definitely. I agree with that. I think that uh, one of the benefits that we've had designing our game was, like, the way I was brought on. I was brought on originally six, five, six years ago to write and to playtest, and we've had a very dedicated group of playtesters over the years that all have their own uh, play styles and their own metas that they like to fall into. Like, I always go for the talker characters. It's just something I like to do. I like the role-playing aspect of it a lot. Uh, there are a couple of murder hobos that we've played with over the years that they don't want magic, they don't want to talk, they want uh, weapons and big weapons. And we have guys who really like the magic and all these things in between. And they do like, they get into a little like between stuff, they double dip, you know, I do a little magic, I do a little talking. And one of the beautiful things that's come out of that is we can see firsthand guys are so familiar with the system that oh wow they can be kind of broken and oh they really can't do everything that we might want that type of character to do so you know we've kind of adjusted organically as we've gone along and it's good because they haven't turned out the same they've turned out extremely different but they all have their own roles to pick we find ourselves in multiple situations in a session you know where it's like okay dean time to step up that time to step up <laughs> so I think that's been in our favor, just because most of our game design has come from a very like uh, team perspective. It's not one person making any of the decisions. Mm -hmm. And even even within that, I'm guessing that there's a few play testers in the group who are who are who are aiming to do one thing and one thing only, and that's find new and interesting ways to break it. Oh yes. Uh, so for years, you know, one of uh, one of the original members of the company before I was even there, one of Josh's uh, old friends, his name's Dan, and Dan is the quintessential, if it can be broke, I will break it player. <laughs> I will find a way to, to make you pay for allowing me to do this thing. And that has plugged a lot of imbalance issues and a lot of holes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So... But at the same time, you know, it's also that balancing act of just, like, that is a little bit broken. It's also very complicated, and it's taken you years to figure that out. So that's kind of cool. You know, like, we might want to, like, still leave that open to a degree. But 
So it's like this this idea of like, yeah, we want balance, but we also want, you know, thrill and excitement and people to have a sense of satisfaction when they learn how to do this thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So definitely aired more on the side in the final iterations of balance. You know, we've scrubbed out most of those other things just because we don't want, you know, people to not have a good time because, oh, he's doing everything or, oh, I can't, you know, get it hidden edgewise because this guy. But it's it's definitely been a process of just like how broke can it be like you know and that now that brings me to to um magic you mentioned magic being scary and dangerous and based on that i th would it be fair of me to assume that you that you're leaning more in the realm of um, sp of spellcasting being uh, being a ri being a significant risk, because what, what 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 I immediately conjures to me um, is th is things like spell is things like spell drain in in Shadowrun or the or the risk of interesting things happening with spe with spell or psychic use in Warhammer or Warhammer Fate 40k role play games. Right. So we, we've gone. We, so we have a system where if you fail, there's three different types of magic. There's there's Tau magic, which is like elements, you know, casting fire, lightning, different things like that. There's witchcraft, which is uh, charm based. It's where you commune with demons to try and gain uh, powers and spells. And then there's blood magic, which is intellect based, which is basically transmutation and necromancy. Mm -hmm. uh, so each of these three magics has their own effects, but they all have consequences. So if you fail to, you know, cast a witchcraft spell, if the if the demon does not accept, you know, your supplication, they might they'll turn on you and hurt you. Uh, if Tau magic, if you fail to channel the energy of your soul properly, you know, it's like it'll it'll punch you instead. So every time you go to make a spell if you say hey i want to try a higher level casting of this i wanted to go for like a level three flames and we're going to say okay you need three successes but if you don't get them it's going to cost you so though magic casters can be extremely powerful can also take damage pretty easily if you know a, a roll doesn't go their way and in a fight that can really cost you mm-hmm so we've tried to make it something where you don't, don't just try to do super powerful magic willy-nilly. You have to either be extremely confident that you can pull it off, or you have to be willing to take that risk. I, I can certainly get behind that. Oh, um, I'm, ge I'm guess I'm guessing that you I'm guessing that you have your own set of rules when it, that br that brings me to something else when it comes to magic is the fact, and this is probably something you already answered, but. You are not, if I'm reading this right, you are not doing fire and forget. Magic is as much of a skill as anything else. Yes. So, it's like anything else, you know, there's the base There's the base spells that you have to learn, and they're treated just like abilities. You have to purchase them. Uh, then there's, just like, you know, like a weapon would have, or a, or a talk, or whatever, different abilities. There's abilities that modify those spells. So, if I have flames... I can manipulate flames in a lot of ways through different abilities, spell books, tomes, different things like that. Just like how I can, you know, take a sniper rifle and I can uh, gain items and abilities to make me better with that gun. So we're trying to treat magic in a way just like it's a weapon. You know, it'll hurt you if you don't use it properly or it can be turned against you. But at the same time, it can also be modified and become more useful to you through achieve or purchase skills. And speaking of that, when it comes to advancement, are you get are you guys doing a experience as currency approach since you're going levelless? Yes. So if you if you do a mission, then typically if if it's a pre written mission and the GM is not just decided to homebrew, then there will be built into it. Say, okay, if they complete the mission, they get X amount of XP. If they found if they did this little side thing, or if they found these other hidden things, then they get another XP, and it can be divvied out like that at the end of the mission. Uh, obviously, a GM can, at their discretion, decide how much that they're going to give you. 
But, and then through completing missions and things like that, you will gain a certain amount of XP, which can then be used to get a new spell, get a new ability, get a new... Items you purchase with money, we have currency, but spells and abilities need experience points. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to spells, um, for a bit of background with this question, a while back I did an experiment with a handful of games that I have to track um, spell bloat. The okay. idea is take the core book of a fan of a fantasy or science fantasy game, um, jot down the total number of pages, and then the number and then the number of pages that are just dictating um, the rules for individual spells, not the rules for spell casting as a whole, but just the just the pages of just spell rules. Um, D and D third edition and Pathfinder were the biggest offenders when it comes to ha when it comes to having the most spell bloat, um, st and stuff like wa stuff like um, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay was in the was in the middle ground. I was using second edition for this, um, and st stuff like Shadowrun and Sa and Savage Worlds were on the lower end of the spectrum. So when it comes to when it comes to spell use, do you do you guys lean towards a small list of spells that can, that has a whole lot of variance, or do you le or do you lean towards a lot of very specific effects? So I, the former, I would say. So like, let's just take Tau Magic for example. Mm -hmm. In Tau Magic, the spells, like the actual true different spells, I can get is nine. There's three pyromancy spells. Three aromancy spells and three aquamancy spells. Aromancy is a special thing we don't talk about. <laughs> but uh, and so and those and those are novice, adept, and master spells, right? So you have to go through the progression of those. So th those are just the nine base spells in Tau Magic. There really is nothing else that you can like begin. And out of those nine spells, you've built the arcing trees of like, well, you can get this ability or this book or this robe, you know. And this will help you affect it, but you need those spells in order to do any of those. Mm -hmm. So you try to keep it, you know, at the beginning very brief. You know, it's like, all right, you're starting off in a very small pocket, and then you're customizing. Yeah. And with, and I think Tau Magic is the most uh, the most extensive one we have, other than perhaps Witchcraft. And Witchcraft is there's there's different demons, and every single demon has two spells. We have a parishioner spell and a priest spell mm -hmm. oh and then from there books tomes uh items that you know that the demons have granted favor to things like that will all give you different variations on those things so we're trying not to have a huge cacophony of base spells to choose from it's very narrow at the beginning and you can build it as you see fit especially since the especially since spells have to share space with um other types of abilities I'd imagine. Exactly. So in the beginning, when you make character creation, uh, you're only going to have one or two abilities. You make your character. You're going to be, you know, you're going to have your kit and your gear that you buy with money, and then you're going to have your spell slash abilities. So you know, it's going to take you a while to get the XP to get up to 10 abilities. And not all of them may want to be magic. If you're, you know, if you're multi-classing, quote unquote, then... You, know, you might have some like it's common that a, a witch, because witch is uh, charisma based, will also be somewhat of a talker. I've played a talker witch hybrid before, so now I have to balance having talker and diplomacy abilities and witchcraft abilities. Mm -hmm. So you know, and then you get to decide how heavy into one or the other do you want to go. So it's just things like that that uh, it, it's part of the balancing act. You know, you don't want to lay on too much for people because then they can't make decisions. Now, within within that, when it comes to we when it comes to we when it comes to um weapons, armor, and the like, I'm guessing you I'm guessing you do have some means to customize it. You already you already hinted at a scope where when we talked about die rolls, so I'm guessing okay. that th that there is going to be room for people to customize their um, weaponry. So weaponry. It's not so much that like there's a lot of items that customize weaponry, it's that it's sort of built into the ability system. So there's something, an ability called Thumb Over Bore, 
right? That allows you to not incur penalties for firing an automatic weapon mm -hmm. for accuracy. There's certain weapons are considered uh, too, hard, too difficult to use effectively if you're if you don't have proper training. So there's an ability called martial training that will not incur the one die penalty for using those weapons. So for things like snipers, there's like an item you can get that's like a, a, a like a ra like a, a notebook is actually one of the fun ones where you can like jot down your ranges and everything. So it's like a rangefinder's notebook. So and the the whole thing there is like oh you know you don't incur a penalty to shots over a certain distance because you can like calculate you know. So it's things like that. We we try not to lean too heavily into weapon customization because then the the pitfall that happens there is it can just be so deep, you know? Yeah. Uh, we did play around with it for a while, but we figured that abilities was actually where that was going to work better because what we wanted to do is encourage people to experiment with various weapons and not just keep, like, customizing and customizing and customizing the same weapon. I can definitely see that because there's a bit of a bad habit am among people to stick with one particular type of kit... When it comes to how, when it comes to how they equip themselves, um, mm -hmm. like somebody somebody who start who started out as a sword and board character, is going to be sticking with sword and board for the, for a good chunk of their adventuring career, even though they can use other weapons, which is why the which is why I say the that whole that whole selling point of of fighters in certain games of oh you can equip any kind of weapon. Yeah, but that doesn't mean a whole lot when I'm only really going to be using one weapon type. Yeah. And and I think that, you know, like while we do we do have obviously we've we've tried to build it into the game to give GMs a lot of freedom. So if they want to, you know, make more weapon customization options, we have uh, ideas in place in documents we're going to release for that. And we do have a few like you can put a silencer on your gun, things like that. So it's gonna it's gonna affect certain things, but you know what we really wanted to do was just to say, hey, you have a shotgun. That's really nice. A shotgun is does this amount of damage and is efficient within these ranges. Whether or not you have a special shotgun, sure. But you know if you're if you know you're gonna be in a lot of open fire fights at long distances, you have the means. Why not get a rifle? You know, or if we're gonna be in uh, really close quarters like cramped setting and your team's gonna be in your way, you might want to go for a melee weapon. So. We're trying to strike that balance where people feel not just empowered, but also like encouraged to make those differing options. You know, like to pursue different types of combat roles. Mm -hmm. Oh, now with the, with that in mind, what I realize that the that the doc that the that it's, you're still in playtesting. Oh, but what are you? Sh but what do you think you'd be shooting for as far as a total page count for the project? Oh, what was the last number that they quoted me? Uh, they're in the process of finishing up the last couple of sections that will go in the final player's handbook. Uh, right now, I think we're sitting just under 400 pages. That includes lore, short stories, the, the monster manual that we're going to include, everything like that. We're kind of trying to lump an entire thing into one volume, because why make people buy multiple books? So, But uh, it's, it's, it's pretty hefty. It's, it's probably sitting around 400 pages. Obviously, after it's formatted and everything in its final form, it might be pared down a bit. We have a good formatter who's pretty good at, you know, uh, getting rid of wasted space, but... Oh, uh, but it, that's you know once you put the art in too because we still have to get a full you know all of our art we have a good portion of it but we don't have all of it so I you know probably around that four hundred page range. Yeah, and I I can certainly see that and I'm, and I do I do look forward to seeing the um dr the draft version when that when it's when it's sufficiently advanced. We are soon going to be, so we're going to be uh, finishing up formatting and branding the, what we're, we're now calling the Playtester's Guide. We're going to rename it the Starter's Guide once it's in a more finalized position. It's going to be a much smaller document, maybe half that length or less. It's going to not have a lot of the fluff and the lore and everything. It's going to have just what you're going to need to run the game. It's going to have an example mission attached to it, maybe two. 
and that will be available for free on our website uh, and various marketplaces like itch.io and everything when it's ready to go out. And, you know, we're, we'll just, we're not worried about, it's going to be just digital only for now. And we're just going to use it to get player feedback and as we continue to work on the final version and hopefully, you know, get people interested in what we have to offer. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll certainly be keeping an eye out on how, on how that develops. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. I've enjoyed the, I've enjoyed the opportunity. Thank you so much for having me. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Man. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>